the latest comment of Lavrov on the case of this attack, this offensive on the Kursk region. He said, with this offensive, with this invasion of Ukraine's invasion of Russia, we cannot negotiate with Zelensky and his, his administration. Well, according to some um, media reports, uh, there were back channel negotiations taking place, I believe in Gutter, um, you know, between Ukraine, Russia, maybe using intermediaries, maybe not directly, but uh, some dialogue uh, designed to, you know, find a mutually acceptable diplomatic off ramp. If, as we remember, you know, Vladimir Putin put a peace plan on the table back in June um, and said, this is the, the peace plan that we're running with. Um, uh, Ukraine rejected it, but the West rejected Ukraine's rejection. And so there seemed to be some effort to find, you know, a, a, a common um, acceptable way to end this conflict. Uh, you know, Russia never bought into that. Russia, I, I think Russia always said we never closed the door on discussions, but it doesn't mean that Russia was desperately searching for an end. Russia understands that it has the uh, momentum that uh, it has the strategic, um, you know, advantage in this conflict. It's getting stronger. Ukraine's getting weaker. Um, but Russia is also aware that this conflict could spin out of control at any minute, uh, given the, um, you know, political investment that the West has made in a Ukrainian victory that isn't going to happen. And and so, you know, Russia, in looking for an end game, is looking how to balance the ego of the West to avoid. Um, unnecessary escalation. So it's a very, um, you know, we just call it a very political environment uh, taking place. That's over. Uh, the Ukrainian invasion of Kursk, which is an invasion of Russia on behalf of NATO, even though both NATO and the United States deny their involvement, this simply could not have happened without a significant involvement. Um, this has terminated the, uh, the negotiations. And um, now all that's left is the strategic defeat of Israel, of Ukraine, um, which will happen on a timetable um, that Russia is in charge of. Uh, you know, Russia is not going to sacrifice men needlessly. Um, uh, Russia is prevailing on the battlefield, even in Kursk. The, the Ukrainian offensive is stopped. Uh, the strategic reserves that were committed are being hunted down and destroyed as we speak. The Russians did not divert significant forces to uh, to respond to curse, they maintain the momentum in Donetsk, and they're on the cusp of a major, major victory um, in the Donbas, in Zaporizhia, uh, as the Ukrainian forces reach uh, the point of collapse, um, meaning that there's the defenses are breached, there's nothing behind them. Uh, there's some talk uh, that uh, Ukraine will order the remaining forces in Donbas to fight to the death. Uh, to delay Russia while Ukraine seeks to rebuild a defensive line uh, on the west bank of the Dnieper River and then leave those forces to die, um, you know, that are that are east of that river. This this is an act of desperation. This is where, you know, Russia is. And, um, you know, so I think I think that's where we're at right now. Um, we are looking at a, a strategic Russian victory. Um, we're looking at a Ukraine that has run out of options because they basically threw their strategic reserves into this uh, gambit in the curse that has failed. And we're looking at a West um, that is watching everything that they've struggled to achieve over the course of the past, um, not just two plus years of conflict, but remember, um, this is a, you know, this is a, the Ukrainian gambit is something that began um, in 2008, when they invited Ukraine as part and parcel of an overall strategic policy designed to leverage Ukraine into a tool capable of um, weakening Russia. Um, the, the West is waking up to the reality that this has failed. And now they're left with this strong Russia, stronger than it was before this conflict started, um, uh, emboldened uh, by this victory over not just Ukraine, but the collective West and angry at the West. Um, from the Western perspective, this is a very dangerous situation. And the, you, you see confusion uh, in Europe, in NATO, uh, in the United States on how to respond to this. Um, just to show you how dangerous this is, uh, the United States back in March uh, modified 
its nuclear employment plan. That means using nuclear weapons. They modified their nuclear employment plan uh, to factor in the new Russian reality, uh, the new North Korean reality, the new Chinese reality. We're, we're talking about the use of nuclear weapons. And when you say modify or update, it means that we have new war plans that envision the use of nuclear weapons against Russia under conditions that are evolving. This is a very, very dangerous situation. Uh, when Abdi Aladanov, the uh, Chechen uh, Russian uh, commander currently in Kursk, uh, says either the war ends this year or we face World War III, he's not exaggerating. Uh, this is a very, very dangerous situation that we are confronted in, with. Yeah. The, the other thing that Zelensky is asking for long range missiles and the permission to attack Russia, do you think that if, as you've mentioned, this counter, this offensive is failing right now, but how about getting nuclear, using dirty nuclear bombs, using these long range missiles against Russia? I don't see Ukraine using a dirty nuclear bomb. That would be just as foolish as can be. But it, I, I can't see Ukraine getting any support for the use of a, of a dirty bomb. Um, anybody who's studied dirty bombs, and I have, um, we, we researched when I was a weapons inspector uh, in Iraq, we, um, we investigated, you know, an Iranian dirty bomb and its potential. Um, it's just not a very good weapon. I mean, one of the interesting things is that the Iranians reached the same conclusion. In pursuing this weapon, um, they did all the the studies, and they went. It's a lot of a lot of uh, you know effort to produce something that doesn't kill that many people. Um, it's not that effective, so I just don't see Ukraine going that route. I see a lot of rhetoric about this designed to gin up emotions, but uh, the the bigger threat is long range weapons. And if the United States does provide some of these standoff weapons that you're talking about. Um, I mean, I think people need to start listening to Russia. Russia won't tolerate this. Russia won't tolerate Ukraine striking deep inside to Russia because Russia recognizes that this isn't Ukraine doing this. This is NATO and the United States doing this. And Russia will respond accordingly. And increasingly, the conversations that senior Russian politicians and senior Russian military uh, officers have is that if NATO seeks to use Ukraine as a proxy to carry out long range strikes inside Russia, that Russia will um, respond um, directly against NATO. And I mean, I'll give a conversation I had uh, yesterday that I think will air tonight, uh, the Scott Ritter show. Um, the, the, the senator said that uh, this will probably in include using nuclear weapons against European states. Um, he threatened Great Britain in particular, said we'll just remove England from the world's map. Um, this is an active senator, a lieutenant general, uh, retired, who has the ear of Vladimir Putin. And I've seen uh, Russian military officers say the same thing. Uh, you, Russia's just not in the business of absorbing blows indefinitely from the West. Um, and, you know, if Russia believes that if NATO takes that step to promote long range strike inside um, uh, Russia, that means that they've made a decision to decisively engage Russia down the road. And Russia is just not going to sit back and let NATO create an environment that maximizes their striking power and minimizes Russia's ability. Russia will re preemptively uh, strike uh, using nuclear weapons. That's the world we live in. I mean, and it, it, this is the data that's out there and nobody's doing anything about it. Everybody's pretending as if this is not a big deal, as if this is... Um, you know, a bluff on the part of Russia. Um, it's not. There are the right-wing party, the party that believes that Russia has to respond more solidly and strongly. Do you think that they're winning over Poon's rhetoric, the way that Poon's, Poon had managed during this conflict? Do you think that there are putting some sort of pressure on Putin and his decisions toward the West, toward Ukraine? Who, who, who's putting pressure on Putin? These people, right-wing parties, who are more radical, who are more against the West, against the policies of the of NATO. No, I, I think Vladimir Putin is the head of the, you know, I mean, he, he's 
been the head of Russia for close to a quarter of a century now. Um, I think he's very much in charge. Um, I think he listens to uh, to to people uh, to to points of view. Uh, but the idea that you can pressure Putin, um, especially um, you know on issues of national security, are that's just not how Russia works. The Russian president doesn't respond to pressure. He responds to facts. He responds to uh, reality. Um, he 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 absorbs this information and he makes decisions based upon that information. But the idea that the Russian president, uh, look, he just won an election in March that solidified his position. Um, uh, you don't win it with those margins only to turn around and say, well, I'm, I'm politically susceptible to pressure from far right parties. No, the far right parties have no pressure, no ability to pressure uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, Putin will make the decisions that he believes are best in the best interest of the, the Russian Federation. Don't you think that the way Putin is responding to any sort of escalation is just perceiving, the West is perceiving this attitude as he's afraid of us. He's afraid of escalation. He's afraid of, that's why the, we don't have any sort of negotiation. They don't want Russia to be at the table to negotiate with. They don't want to do anything politically, just sending weapons, more aids to Ukraine so far. And, We see the same type of attitude so far from Putin and his administration, just going on and on. How do you make sense of this attitude on part of Putin? And don't you think that he's getting to the point that his patience is perceived in the West as his weakness? I think both the Russian president, the Russian leadership, and frankly speaking, the Russian people, just don't care about the West anymore. They don't care what you think. They don't care what I think. They don't care what anybody thinks in the West. They're done with the West. Um, the notion that Russia needs to do things to convince a Western audience about what the truth is, is absurd. Russia only needs to do things that um, you know promote uh, Russia's interests. Um, you know, Putin only plays to a Russian audience. He is only responsive to a Russian audience. Uh, he does have to balance in the you know, consideration of the rest of the world. Um, and this is one of the reasons why you see such a pragmatic, uh, patient, uh, responsible leader, because you know he is demonstrating to the numerous nations that are rallying around the BRICS forum that Russia is, is a responsible player. Um, It's not Russia's job to convince the West that Russia is serious. Um, and I think that's the problem is that in the West, you know, we're like, well, Russia's not explaining things to us. Therefore, we start to read into it. That means that Putin's scared. Putin's this, Putin's that. I think it just means that Putin doesn't care. It's not his job to make you and I uh, comfortable with what Russia is doing. Um, the, the day and age where Russia... Um, cares about Western public opinion, Western political opinion is long past. Um, they care about the global South. They care about China. They care about India. Uh, but they don't care about the United States and Europe anymore. Don't you think that Ukraine is going to be a continuous problem for Russia if they continue this attitude of attacking on the Russian territory, this type of just bombing civilian areas? That's why I think that Russia has a path to communicate with the European Union, at least to have some sort of, to, to solve this problem that we call it right now is Ukraine. And without having any political settlement on Ukraine, they cannot be, they have to focus on their economy and other things. But with Ukraine having on your border and having all of these problems, how you can manage that? Well, first of all, the idea that um, Russia can view Europe as a uh, reliable partner, because to engage with Europe means that you you hope to achieve something beneficial from this engagement. Europe's just shown itself to be liars. Going back to Minsk, when uh, you know, uh, Francois Hollande, the French president, and um, Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, lied to Putin, saying, no, we are promoting peace. But They later admitted, no, Minsk was just a sham to buy time to give NATO a chance to build the Ukrainian army that it can more effectively confront Russia. Um, I, I don't know why the West doesn't understand that once France and Germany does that, that Russia will never again trust them. 
the United States has repeatedly lied to um, to, to Russia about arms control, about a, a number of things. Russia no longer trusts the United States. It's not a reliable partner. Um, so the 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 idea that um, you know Putin is is looking to Europe to save the day, you know, to come in and do the right thing by Ukraine is absurd. I always remind people you have to listen to the words of the Russian president. And one speech I would advise everybody to go back and, and reread is the speech that Putin gave on the eve of initiating the special military operation when he talked about the history of Ukraine. Um, and he did so, again, in his interview with Tucker Carlson, which people rolled their eyes. Um, they called it Russian propaganda. Read it again, because it tells you everything about where Russia is right now. Um, I'll just shorten it. Ukraine is a historical mistake. It's a mistake made by uh, Lenin. And um, Russia is going to fix this mistake. I'll say it one more time so people understand what I'm saying. The only reason why Ukraine exists is because of a political mistake made by Lenin. And Russia is now going to correct this mistake. That means Ukraine isn't going to exist when this is done. You keep saying that Ukraine is going to be there, this festering wound, this constant problem. No, it won't. Ukraine isn't going to exist when this is done. Whatever we call Ukraine today isn't going to exist. It's going to be something else. And for that, you can thank Ukraine for invading Russia. You can thank the West for facilitating this invasion. Uh, Vladimir Putin had a plan on the table back in June that envisioned a, 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 a Ukraine that retained Odessa, Kharkov, Sumy, Nepopetrovsk, Nikolaev. Uh, these are territories that many in Russia are saying have to be Russian. And the plan put on the table by Putin said, no, 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 this will be Ukraine. Putin was talking about a, a, an independent Ukraine. It had to be neutral. It couldn't have a NATO army in it. Um, and the Banderist uh, ideology had to be um, eliminated. But Ukraine was a, going to be an independent state. I don't think they're talking in that language anymore. Um, they speak of the Kiev regime, eliminating the Kiev regime. Um, they're no longer talking about Ukraine as a nation state because I think their goal and objective is that when this is done, there will be no Ukrainian nation state. When it comes to the Washington and their policy right now, let's. I'm going to play a clip here, Scott. The Ukrainians, in terms of their their focus, you heard President Zelensky say it was to create a buffer zone. So we're we're having those conversations to learn more about what their objectives are. Again, if you take a step back from a U.S. perspective, our focus continues to be. Uh, enabling Ukraine to be a free and sovereign country that can deter Russian aggression in the future. Uh, and so that main, that continues to be our, our focus. Um, as it relates to their operation in Kursk, as I mentioned, uh, they, they clearly uh, have compelled the Russians to uh, struggle in their response. Uh, it has certainly uh, demonstrated the creativity uh, and the battlefield prowess of the Ukrainians. Uh, but when it comes to uh, what their longer term objectives are here, that's something that we're still discussing with them. Thank you, sir. Yeah, he's talking about creativity of Ukrainians in terms of this attack and how they're going to support Ukraine. In your opinion, do they have any sort of a strategy right now with what's going on between Russia and Ukraine or just telling just trying to convince the press that we are going to support Ukraine for, for I don't know, for how many years they, they have in their mind. Well, I think, first of all, we have to look at what Ukraine um, was a, a, a attempting to do with this Kursk incursion. Uh, they were seeking to take significant territory uh, inclusive of the Kursk nuclear power plant to seize this territory uh, to get what they uh, basically called, um, I forget the, the, the exact term, but uh, you know, it, it, it's basically to get chips on the table that they can trade for the chips that Russia has. Um, to say, we'll give you back Kursk in the, in the Kursk nuclear power plant in exchange for the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and Kherson, 
um, something of that nature, an exchange that could allow uh, Zelensky then to seek a ceasefire on terms that showed, look, he he pushed Russia back. Uh, this is deterrence to Russia. Um, that was one objective. The other one was to get the Russians to divert significant military resources from their ongoing offensive operations in the Donbass um, and effectively halting those operations at the moment when they're having the greatest success and diverting these resources to deal with the Kursk incursion. Um, so that was the, the goal and objective. And, you know, from a Western standpoint, that's, um, those are strategic objectives. Now the West is confronted with the reality that, uh, one, the, the, the Ukrainians didn't come anywhere near the cursed nuclear power plant Two, uh, the cursed gambit is failing. The Russians didn't divert significant resources. They responded with two Marine brigades and the Akhmat special forces that are in the process of hunting down. Uh, the Ukrainians on on Russian soil and killing them. Um, you know, this will take some time. Uh, Opti Aladanov, uh, the uh, Chechen uh, general, Russian general in charge of the Akhmat Special Forces, has said this is very difficult fighting. Uh, these uh, Ukrainians have, you know, good training. They have uh, good equipment. Uh, they have good command and control. They fight uh, using a, a different standard than any Ukrainian force has ever done before, a, a NATO standard. Um, you know, integrating artificial intelligence into the concept of operations, modern communications, uh, et cetera. Uh, but he said, we are winning. We've stopped them and now we're killing them. Um, that's the reality. So the Ukrainians aren't going to have any chips to trade. Um, what they've done is they've taken their best trained forces, best equipped forces that could have been used to help um, stabilize the situation in the Donbass. And instead, they've expended them in order to save these forces. Now, they've had to take additional brigades from the Zaporizhia area and deploy them in to try and, you know, stabilize the collapse of the Ukrainian position in Kursk, further weakening their position um, in the Donbass. Meanwhile, Russia continues to advance almost unimpeded in the West. Uh, we're looking at the, you know, the veritable collapse of Ukraine defense there. Um, so the Kursk operation has been an absolute failure. Um, now the West is trying to spin it in a way that, um, on the one hand, uh, sort of gives the Ukrainians a little pat on the back, uh, saying, good job. But on the other hand, washing their hands of it, saying, you know, we don't know what the strategic goals and objectives of Ukraine are. And we're worried uh, that Ukraine may not have the ability to accomplish that what it set out to do. Do we know how many forces they've used for this offensive? Um, the, the Russians have said that 18 different units, brigades, uh, separate battalions, uh, regiments, uh, basically the equivalent of two divisions have been uh, deployed uh, in support of this with more brigades coming up. So the, the number of troops um, is between like nine and 12,000 um, with the potential even more being added to the fight. Um, you know, but they've already lost close to 4,000 um, you know, casualties dead. And um, they're losing more. They've lost a tremendous amount of equipment. And so, you know, even if they're able to withdraw, um, you know, a majority of the remaining bodies back into Ukraine, the equipment that went in with them, the Challenger tanks, the M1 Abrams, the Leopards, the Martyrs, the Bradleys, the Strikers, um, this equipment's being destroyed. Um, they, 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 again, they've basically sacrificed their strategic reserves uh, to achieve, you know, short-term political TikTok videos. Uh, it's it's sort of ironic that uh, the majority of the videos that we saw early on in this conflict showing Ukrainians going up and taking their po photographs uh, at, at town plates and doing things, um, the Russians now have responded with videos that either show those people dead or captured. I mean, that's the that's the fate of um, every Ukrainian that's gone into Kursk unless they can get out of Kursk. And Russia is not just striking back at Kursk, but they're striking the logistical support hubs and command and control hubs in the Sumy uh, province. Um, and they're just devastating. As Ukraine brings up reinforces, reinforcements, they arrive in Sumy and they're hit by the, um, the glide bombs and, uh, you know, they never make it in. So this is just devastating all around for Ukraine. And how about the percentage of mercenaries got in this operation? Do we do we have any sort of information on that? Well, I don't have an exact number. I, I do know that the uh, Russians have provided anecdotal evidence that um, 
you know, when they monitor the uh, communication nets, they hear a lot of Polish voices, a lot of French voices, a lot of English voices. Um, but in terms of, you know, the, the, the prisoners that they, that they present, the bodies that they show, these are primarily uh, Ukrainians. Uh, and so I would guess that um, you have, for instance, the International Legion that is there, um, multiple battalions um, of, of troops, but the vast majority of the troops that were uh, engaged in this fighting are Ukrainian troops. And in these mercenaries, do you think the majority of them are just fighting for money? or they're just believing in what they're doing? It's hard to get into the motivation of a mercenary. Um, I think many of them are just adventurers who um, who have become addicted to war. Um, you know, a lot of the Americans and some of the British are people who uh, volunteered previously to fight um, against uh, ISIS in, uh, in Syria on the side of the Syrians. Uh, uh, you know, and they've just, they've become addicted to war. And so they, they go there. Others are people who are unsatisfied with their situation at home. Others are military veterans who didn't see combat while they were in or were in um, jobs that wouldn't allow them to see combat. And they decided they want to prove their manhood. I, I can't speak to the motivation of these individuals. Uh, I think it changes per person. The money isn't that good. Um, you know, it's not the equivalent of, you know, what a, a Blackwater operative was earning in Iraq. But, um, you know, it's a chance to, um, to go out and kill Russians. And so that is something that many people find attractive. And the other thing that Russians were talking about was this, the U.S. journalists in this region. Do you, is that, do you think, what would the motive of this sending journalists to the region and is that based on international law? Is it against international law? How do you find it? I think a journalist is a journalist. Um, you know, they, 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 they do their job. Uh, generally speaking, journalists are held accountable to the laws. <laughs> Not generally speaking, but in every case, uh, you're held accountable to the laws of the nations you work in. Uh, we, we saw that with Evan Gershkowitz, the uh, Wall Street Journal journalist, who claims he was researching a story, but he received... Uh, classified information, and the Russians prosecuted him as a spy, um, probably because he was one. But even if he, he wasn't, he he acted like one. Um, you know, from the Russian perspective, you you can't enter Russian territory without the permission of the Russian government. And so, if you're a journalist who has crossed into Russia as part of this uh, cursed incursion, you're in violation of Russian law. Um, we can even take it a step further. Some of the units that are operating inside. Uh, Kursk are um, units affiliated with the Banderist ideology uh, that Russia has labeled to be criminal units, terrorist units. And so if a journalist has embedded, now they're providing material support for terrorism. And that's another criminal offense that could be um, that could be well, put on them. So, you know, journalists have to be careful. Look, we've, we've seen journalists travel to Crimea and have the Ukrainians uh, attack them by saying, you know, you've gone into Ukrainian territory without our permission. I have traveled to Crimea. I have traveled to Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, and Lugansk. Um, totally in conformity with Russian law, but from the Ukrainian perspective, I'm violating Ukrainian law. So, um, you know, journalists just have to be careful on um, on what they do and, and try to ensure that, uh, you know, they're doing their journalistic duties of uh, reporting, you know, the, the fact-based truth from um, from a ground level. Just to wrap up this session, Scott, do you see any sort of concern in the European Union with what's going on in this region in, with this attack on Russian soil? Not enough. Um, I've seen the Germans gloating. I mean, it's it's unbelievable what, what we see happening in Germany where German officers uh, dressed in their formal uniforms are, you know, briefing the battle, uh, you know, drawing arrows around Kursk as if they have no, uh, you know, notion of history and, you know, 